All right, recording the story. We're good? We're good. Okay, everybody shut up. <laughs> this is one of those four by three fixes, probably the right one. It's the end of the day, so you get a little punchy rap. Um, we're going to do this without a microphone uh, for various reasons. My name is Chris Sanders. We're going to be talking today about abstract tools for effective threat hunting. Who knows what I mean when I mean when I say abstract tools? Absolutely no one? Good, that means what I have to say is of some value. Okay, who knows what I mean when I say threat hunting? A few people. How many people do threat hunting in their jobs? Show me very loud. Very few. How many people are interested in doing threat hunting in their jobs? That's bad. Okay, I can leave that. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Abstract tools. An abstract tool is a tool that doesn't really exist. It's not tangible. You might use a tool like Snort, Bro, um, Splunk on a commercial lamp, a Sim of some sort. Those are tangible physical tools you're using for hunting. Abstract tools are really tools of the mind in this case. Ways to think about and process information when you're doing hunting to take some type of input or create some type of input and get to some type of logical output. Right? When we're doing investigations, we're talking about taking perception and going to reality. Now it's important to note that those are two very different things, right? We have our perception of the world and we know the world as it really exists. In investigation, we have to get from perception to reality and hope, really hope, that the gap has been bridged fully and our perception is reality. Right? That's all an investigation is. Now it's much, much harder than that, right? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about abstract tools that help us do that from a threat hunting perspective. Now, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Sanders. I'm from a very small town, not too far from here, about two and a half hours northwest, called Mayfield, Kentucky. That's the town there. That's the whole town. There's not much. There's, <laughs> there's like a stoplight here, and there's like a McDonald's there, and then a the small Walmart back there. Not a super Walmart, just a regular one. It's like this. Uh, so I'm from Mayfield, Kentucky. I live in Georgia now. Uh, I worked primarily in defense before uh, eventually going to work for a company called Guardians. I worked there for a while. I went to a place called Manion, which some of you may have heard of. And left there about a month ago to start my own company called Cloud Network Defense, where I focus on cost effective security training. Uh, I also worked with a company called the World Technology Fund, which is a nonprofit. You've heard it mentioned a few times here and there. Uh, I founded it in 2008 to provide technology resources to kids from areas like I was from, places like Mayfield, Kentucky, where they don't have nearly as many resources for doing uh, or for learning about technology as their urban counterparts. So we started that in 2008. Uh, it's been going pretty good. Last year we, uh, we impacted 10,000 students. That's we put technology in the hands of 10,000 kids in 30 states across the country. Super proud of that. Uh, so far this year, we've done that with 12,000 kids, where we get to 25,000 without willing. Um, we're having a nice little silent auction uh, back there in the fishbowl. I'll talk about that when I wrap up uh, as we'll be ending shortly after this talk. Okay, so let's get to the talk. Framing. Abstract tools, right? Tools of the mind. You have to frame things appropriately in order to be able to use tools correctly, right? So I want to talk about how we frame threat hunting and how it's a lot of the ways the same as a normal investigation, a normal alert driven network security monitoring type investigation, but also how it's a little bit different. So I want to talk about that. And one thing that really irks me with threat hunting is a lot of people see it as a very elite skill, right? Only your best of your best can be your threat hunters. I don't really buy that. Matter of fact, I think that's troubling and I think it's kind of damning a little bit on our industry. And it really doesn't serve to help anybody except for those who are already at that elite level. I think everybody can be a threat hunter. I think you certainly can get, you can get better at it as you gain more experience. We'll talk about how you gain that experience in a little bit. But generally, uh, you know, most, many places with large number of analysts do a structure like you see right here. Tier one event analysts, tier two incident responders, and tier three, your super elite or your hunters. Uh, I worked for a government agency at one point where, and this is before I'd done really any threat hunting. I got to go meet the threat hunting team. This was up in some place uh, in Maryland area. And I went to meet their hunting team. And they said, oh, Chris, you're interested in hunting. Well, that's what we do, and it's super awesome. We're badass, and it's fun. I, that's cool. I, too, would like to be a badass. <laughs> so I was like, well, show me what you do. And they're like, no, we can't do that. You're not ready. <laughs> that really hurt. That, that hurt me. That didn't really sit well with me. Like, you mean I'm not ready? Like, I can do investigations, but what's, what's the secret sauce that I can't know about? It hurt me. It didn't go well. And I carried that with me for a long time. That was probably eight years ago. Um, so I don't buy that. I think anybody can do hunting. I think you're sure you need experience to be really good at it. I think anybody can do it to some degree. Now investigations. When you think about an investigation, a lot of times it means you've gotten an alert. 
maybe from an IDS, like a snort or a CERT pilot, something like that. And then you go investigate something. And that's one way to do an investigation. But really, investigations are all very similar. And I'll boil that down into this process you have on the screen here. Right? So five steps. I'm going to go through these really quickly. In any investigation, you have an observation. Right? That's your initial input. That's when you say something is odd or something is weird. Now, that input doesn't have to be something you necessarily get on. It could be a phone call, right? One of the main ways that big breaches are found is the FBI finds a, uh, a piece of hardware out there that has some stolen data on it, and they call the company that owns the data. Not a call you want to get, right? <laughs> but uh, that's, that's an observation, right? Someone calling you and saying, hey, we think you're wrong. So that's the way an investigation can be done. It can be the IDS alert driven way. It can be through hunting, which means you're kind of manually finding those things that are going wrong. Or maybe it's uh, maybe you're a malware. Someone hands you a piece of malware and they say, we think this is evil. So that's the beginning of the investigation. So you have that initial observation. That's your input for the investigation process. From there, you have the cycle of questions, hypotheses, and answers. When I say questions, I say, okay, you have this thing which you know is weird or you think is weird, and you need to dig into it. So what are you going to do? Well, human nature is we're going to ask the question. You're not going to necessarily even realize you're doing this, but you're going to ask the question, and then you're going to make a hypothesis. So you're going to ask the question, kind of leaning in one way or another, right? You might lean towards it's evil, you might lean towards it's not being evil, but you're going to have some type of lean, some type of bias, so to speak, when you're thinking about hypothesis. You're going to see answers to that question, that's when we look at data. That's when we go pull PCAP or pull NetFlow or pull memory images, things of that nature. That's when we go try to figure out the answer to our question. And then when you find that answer, generally in an investigation, that begets more questions, right? That's why this is the cycle here in the middle. So, Answers, we get more questions, we get more answers, and that goes and goes and goes until we get to a conclusion. Right? That's when we have enough evidence to back some type of conclusion that says what's going on. That's where we're bridging this gap in perception of reality. Now, does this look familiar to anybody? This, this kind of chart, does it look like anything that I've seen? Maybe something in a science textbook? <laughs> scientific method, right? It's very similar to the scientific method, very similar thing. And there's a reason for that, right? We don't have the scientific method because some old dudes sat in a room one day and said, this is how we should do science. Now let's go do some science. That's not how it worked. They stood, they sat and they examined where these old dudes were. I don't know if they were. They sat and examined how scientific discovery happens. They said, what are the processes throughout history that people have used subconsciously to do science? Right? And the scientific method kind of came from it. I'm going to believe this is a similar type approach for investigations, right? And I don't call this, you know, an investigation framework. I don't say this is how you should do investigations. I'm saying that's how you're already doing it. Whether you realize it or not, subconsciously you're doing this. And there's a distinct benefit to taking a subconscious process, highlighting it, teaching it to people, making them cognitively aware of it, and bringing it from subconscious to the front conscious, right? So to the active consciousness where we can focus on it, teach to it, so if we can teach to it, we can make people better animals, right? That's pretty cool. So that's the investigation process. And I want to be clear that I think this is generally universal. I think if you go talk to a lot of hunting talks, a lot of malware talks, everyone wants to talk about how they're different. And they are different in some way. We use different tools, right? That's one big way. But generally speaking, the investigation process is fairly universal. And I think that's very important for framing, uh, not just this talk, but framing everything we're going to be doing as blue teamers, as investigators, uh, or for you red teamers who are hiding out in this room undetected uh, about seeing trees. There we go. Right? Uh, so the investigation process is pretty universal. So what I want to challenge you with when I talk about an abstract tool you can use is this statement right here. What question am I, am I trying to answer? If you're investigating anything at any point in the investigation, you need to be able to say, what question am I trying to answer and be able to articulate? If you're looking at data, if you're seeking answers to something, you need to be able to articulate the question you're trying to answer. Otherwise, I'll be clear on this, otherwise you're lost. And that's very, very important. The number one reason most people burn out with teamwork is they get stuck, they get lost. They dig into the data. It's not not having enough data, it's having too much data. So they get lost and they don't know what to do. And they burn out, they fizzle out, there's nobody made out for mentorship, there's nobody around to tell them how to get out. And that's not good. So if you can always state what you're trying to answer, that's the best thing you can do to keep yourself from getting lost in an investigation. Does that make sense? Okay. Next thing, observation strategies. Now observation is important. Remember that investigation process, the first step was an observation. Right? Now we're talking about hunting here. 
in a typical alert driven investigation, you have an IDS alert, and that's your observation. That's what the machine generated. It's very simple when you go from that. Hunting's a little bit different because generally, you can use alerts for hunting input, but generally speaking, hunting input is coming from you as a human. You're actually manually perusing through data, finding things that say, oh, well, that looks weird, and then digging into it. Right? So that observation stage, where it might be really small for alert driven investigations, is very large for a hunting based operation. Okay, so observation strategy. I'm going to talk about a couple of those right now. Uh, mainly TTP driven observations and data driven observations. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make observations for hunting. Right? I'm going to talk about the two most common that I think are applicable to everyone. And if you never wanted to do hunting, I saw a lot of people who said they don't do hunting and want to, this is where to start. Data driven observations. Simple question Can I find anything in my data that looks like it doesn't belong? Right? Again, the problem for most people is not going to have enough data. Sure, maybe there's some data types we'd like to have that we don't. But generally, it's I have too much data. So how do I make sense of it? Especially if you're collecting 24 by 7, right? Even on a small number, that's a whole lot of data. You can't just manually peruse it. You need to do some, some fanciness, we'll say, to uh, figure that out. Let's go to an example here. HTTP data. That's something most people, I don't say most people, a lot of people collect. So it's pretty easy. Especially a lot of us are running proxies. Right? Those proxies have logging options. You can turn that on. Uh, you can log to local disk, you can send those to a syslog server, you can send them to Splunk through SIM. HTTP logs are pretty universal. Um, they vary a little bit, but you can take HTTP data. Um, a lot of us know a little bit about HTTP data because it's what we use to browse the web. It's one of the most common unit protocol used in many of our networks. So if we know about it, we can take a field from it. Let's take the user agent field. User agents are what the HTTP client uses to identify itself to the server. Now, it can be anything, right? Our browsers have specific ones for specific versions, but they can be spoofed. They can be, if you write a Python script, you can make it be anything you want, right? So, that's of interest, right? There's not a massive amount of those that should appear on general network. We're going to have a lot of browsers and a lot of different versions of those. We should be able to do some interesting things. So, let's transform that data. And there are a lot of ways to transform data. One of those is an aggregation. Many of you probably use aggregation, although you probably don't use that term. An aggregation is simply Taking data, uh, picking a field within that data, and <coughs> grouping things together. Right? We'll talk more about aggregations later. In this case, we're going to do an aggregation on the user agent field and sort by least frequent occurrence. Right? If I have 10,000 endpoints and they're all running Chrome, I should probably got 10, at least you know that that specific uh, instance of Chrome and have like 10,000 hits. Now I might have it maybe broken up a little bit based on versions and things like that. I'm not really concerned about what's at the top of that. The most frequent occurrence. I'm concerned with the least frequent occurrence is. Why do I have links running on my network? You know, links is text based rel. Yeah, that, that's weird. Um, why do I have? Why do I see Python URL link here? It's the URL link library which is used to retrieve URLs uh, in Python. Right? Somebody's clear with the script. Is one of my admins. Is there a bad guy? Why do I have one off, a one off occurrence of a user agent that looks like it's Internet Explorer, but one of the characters involved? Probably one of the most common techniques used by even very sophisticated target malware to identify itself is that, right? It's custom URL strings that the server is used to identify incoming command control connection things. So, this is what I just did. The process I just described is this right here. We chose the data type, we chose a specific field, and then the yellow one's a little hard to read. It says, ask what would be weird here. Right? So, for our network, in this case, I said it would be weird if I had these ratings that were unexpected. We applied a data transformation, this time it was an aggregation, and then we sorted that by least frequent occurrence, which gave us a data output we could use for hunting. This is a very effective hunting technique. I use it all the time, I'm always find evil. Sometimes it's very simple evil, sometimes it's commodity evil. Very, very effective technique for finding very serious evil. The fact of the matter is, most people in this room will never have to deal with APT, nation state actors, and things like that, but those guys are also using the path of least resistance, right? So, not to say that you could catch some more things using this technique. Very powerful. This is a search on my networks I run every single week. But it's very cool, very powerful. TTP driven observations. That's the second kind I want to talk about. What's a TTP? What does that stand for? <laughs> tools, techniques, and procedures. Some I say tools, tactics, and procedures. Same general gist of that. The question we're asking this time is can I find any evidence of a known TTP on my network? So, what TTPs do I know of? Well, this is really suitable for things that aren't suitable for alerting, right? Most TTPs, or not most, but a lot of TTPs, we're going to build into alerts, right? Like rules that are going to alert. But not all of those are going to be specific enough. Think of something like a 
user uh, account being added to a domain admin. On a small network, you might want to know what kind of happens. If you're on a network of any reasonable size, that might happen all the time. Or maybe just some type of user account being added to, uh, added to a privileged group. So that's good hunting spotter, right? That makes sense. So that's just a very simple example, but similar process. In this case, you research an attack type, you isolate artifacts that aren't suitable for an IDS, things that are a little too broad, things you don't necessarily work on every time. And then you use some type of analysis technique, whether it's a search like or an aggregation like we just talked about, and then you repeat. And that's essentially a hunting play. If you think of like a playbook, that's a play. You go elaborate of those, guess what? All of a sudden you're a hunter. Right? So you go from no longer wanting to say I want to do hunting to actually doing hunting quite easy. So those are observations. Now I want to talk about um, more, even more abstract brain stuff. Curiosity. Um, for my money, one of the questions I get asked all the time is what is the X factor that makes a really good analyst or a really good hunter? Um, I think they're doing the same thing, I think it's curiosity. Now, Curiosity is a big word, it can mean a lot of things. How would you guys describe curiosity? Does anybody have an idea? Take a shot. Or you just want me to just tell you that sometime? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Curiosity has a lot of big, fancy scientific uh, definitions. Uh, the one I prefer is simply the desire to know. Pretty straightforward, right? It's not, now, be clear, it's not the ability to know, it's not the ability to learn, it's the desire to know, the desire to learn. It's when you're sitting late at night and you're looking at that data output and you see something that looks weird and actually clicking on it. Actually taking on it and performing another, taking it and performing another search on it. Right? That's curiosity. Now curiosity is important because it relates very directly to experience. You know, if we take two animals, we'll call them Jack and Diane. Two American kids living in the heart of the Who happen to be security animals. <laughs> So Jack and Diane, let's say they're fresh out of college, they both get hired on that exact same experience, they both get hired on at a company. Same exact job. Five years later, we look in on Jack and Diane again. So in this case, Diane is much better at analyst than Jack. She's a much better threat hunter. By all accounts, she's excelled much greater in her job. Why? Well, you might say experience, but they have the same experience in terms of years, right? Which is funny because most of us in our jobs, when we're asked, how much experience do you have? We'll say, oh, I have five years or ten years experience. But time is a horrible quantifier of experience. Right? It's, it's two one-dimensional experiences a lot more involved than that. Now, for my money, I, I would say that the difference between Jack and Diane, all other things being equal, is that Diane is probably generally more curious than Jack. Right? So that's the desire to know. It's, it's, uh, what I've observed through my career is the one thing separating really good analysts, really good investigators, and I'll say really good red teamers for our pretty wearing person here in the front row. Uh, <laughs> red teamers as well. That curiosity, the ability to poke and prod at things, and when you see something that looks a little weird, pursuing it. Right? Now, curiosity is an interesting thing because curiosity is not a static value, right? We're not all the same level of curiosity at the same amount of time. Right? Here's a couple of examples. But right. notice we have, down here on the, on the x-axis, we have time and years, we have experience. Um, again, remember, they're, they're not directly correlated here. So in this case, at the top, you see someone with what I would call sustained high curiosity. Right? They're basically, throughout their time spent, so here across about 16 years, they remain curious. They started curious, remain curious, and their experience level, uh, again, not experience in terms of just years, experience in terms of ability to do the job well. We see kind of the opposite down here at the bottom. Uh, experience in terms of, or excuse me, curiosity in terms of sustained low curiosity. This is someone who's probably never really curious, never really developed a lot of curiosity, so their experience level grows very slowly. But so you can very easily say the top of the eye and the bottom of the jacket. Um, this is a very realistic depiction of what I think curiosity looks like in most people. Uh, one that looks a little closer <laughs> might be like this. At the top, we have something I would call waning curiosity. Notice how we go up, uh, notice how we go up pretty dramatically at the beginning of the career and then it kind of levels off. Right? I think many of us might be able to relate to that. Right? I was a young single guy coming out of college, I had nothing better to do. I worked 18 hour days and seven days a week and had a really great time. Um, life happened, got involved in other things, got other hobbies, got married, uh, many folks have kids, things like that. Other things detract from curiosity. Right? We, we want to have the sense that our personal lives 
and our work lives are very separate things. And it's just in the local alarm, right? Everything we do in our work life and our personal life affects the other. That's very important. I think the keynote this morning kind of spoke to some of that. So that's where we see Wayne's curiosity, where it often wanes in terms of later in people's careers. Similarly, we have the opposite effect for many people. That's what we see down here, where someone starts out with kind of lower curiosity, and the curve kind of builds. They find curiosity later in their life. Right? There's a lot of reasons that happen. One is some people find their dream career much later in life. Some people are pigeonholed, maybe you're a sysadmin. You don't really like being a sysadmin. You get into security, and then you just take off, right? It really keeps your curiosity. Right? I think a lot of us maybe in this room probably relate to that, or at least some group. So this is closer to what I would say real curiosity looks like, right? But still, I wouldn't say it's like this or like this. For most of us, curiosity probably looks like this, <laughs> right? So that, that's the, the fact. This is a little bit of an oversimplification. But curiosity is incredibly important. I would say, uh, generally speaking, uh, probably the most important thing in terms of abstract tools that allow people to better obtain experience and the secrets to success of dying. Now, in terms of the relationship of curiosity to expertise, I kind of map them out this way in terms of our particular field. And you'll see some shadows of the things we just talked about. So green, obviously good, red, obviously bad, surprise. Uh, I guess blue would be better for the green. <laughs> um, so someone with high curiosity and high experience is someone who clearly excels based on what we just talked about. To the left of that, we see someone with high curiosity and low experience. Someone new to the field. Wow. A lot of people are really excited, they're really glad to be here. Um, they're looking at all these alerts, doing all these investigations, and everything looks equal to them. Right? Because they don't, they don't know. They've never seen a lot of this stuff, so everything looks weird to them because they don't know what normal is. Right? That makes them jumpy. They want to report everything. I've been in socks with these people. Okay, test your patience. <laughs> but that's okay. These people can move into this Excel area with their eye leadership and mentorship, right? Someone to direct that curiosity, to direct them in the right places, to constructively tell them, hey, this is nothing, let me tell you why, so you can learn from the next day. Very, very important. Now, notice the top, the green. Experience doesn't matter, right? High curiosity is what matters in this chart. On the bottom side, you have people with low curiosity. You have our people with low curiosity, high experience. We talk about waning curiosity. You know, those folks, we all know them. They kind of, they kind of phoned it in, right? They're collecting their paycheck. They're not really they don't like care anymore. It seems like those apathetic is the word. Ineffective. People with low curiosity, low experience. Not only do they not have the ability to adequately do the job, they also lack the curiosity that's going to prevent them from doing the job or learning, gaining experience at a satisfactory degree, right? So that's curiosity. Let's talk about something a little more tangible. Pivot. What's a pivot? You want to take a shot at that one? Turn. A turn, okay. Change of direction. Change of direction, okay. Looks like the key is where the whole is applied to another direction. Similar fields, maybe a source IP or Something that you can correlate between different long types. Okay, everybody was right. Uh, those are all correct. I, I like how we went through that because it went very abstract and very specific. <laughs> right? And so that's good because we're actually going to talk about the specific, right? We're going to talk about pivots uh, in terms of network data. So this is an abstract tool, it's a little bit more tangible. So basic pivot, this is a basic pivot. We have an alert. We've talked about alerts a lot already, right? You have snore alerts, or hot alerts, some type of IDS, uh, maybe some commercial IDS. Cisco AMP or something like that. Um, you get an alert. An alert has data with it, right? It says, this bad thing happened, here's the data we know about. If it's a network based alert, it often has an IP address. In this case, source or destination IP address. So that's the field. So a pivot in this case is when you take, like, like the gentleman up here said, when you take a specific field from this piece of data, take that field, look for it in another piece of data where that field is common, right? So those Two pieces of data, or two sources of data, share a common bond with a single pivot. That's a pivot. Most of the question and answer we do in the investigation process is based upon pivoting. Very rarely, really, do we are able to focus on a single data source in an investigation figure out what we want to do that. It requires some type of pivot. So this is a really common pivot. You take an alert, you take the source and destination IP address it provides, and you pivot to packet capture data. We all have packet capture data, right? All encompassing. Here's another one. Flow data. I love flow data. Flow data is like packet capture, but much faster to analyze. Right? It's like a 
log of, it's like when you think of your cell phone, and I'll still the example Jason used this morning, his call, your cell phone bill, right? Maybe we don't look at it as much as we used to. Your cell phone bill has a line by line entry of every call you make. Time, source, destination, duration. That's basically what Flowdat is before network communications, whereas PCAP is context for interaction. That's basically like a recording of the call. Right? So those both share some similar characteristics. We can start with flow data, take a very broad time range, shrink it down to something really manageable, take the IP address information, and pivot over to PCAP. We can also take the source and destination for information, pivot over to PCAP, focus on a specific conversation. We're reducing our data set. Right? That's pretty cool. Here's going uh, another way. We start with PCAP in this case. We're looking at PCAP. We have a domain. The domain name looks very suspicious. FreeMachineLearning.net. <laughs> sounds suspicious. Sounds suspicious to me. But we don't know it's bad, so we need to pivot to open source intelligence. Open source intelligence places like virus total, asset total, um, various online websites where you can search for these things and look for uh, examples of maliciousness. So that's a PCAP to OSINT uh, pivot on the domain field. The cool thing about that is we're pivoting actually outside of the <coughs> We're pivoting from internal data source to public data source, which is perfectly valid too. Here's a really great one, HTTP proxies. I mentioned earlier a lot of us are on HTTP proxies. Many of those are user aware, so they tie username in those logs. So that username is there, you can actually get it to the Windows logs uh, of a specific endpoint or all your endpoints and look for evidence that ties those two things together. And this is really cool because this is tying a network data source to a host-based data source. Right? And that's actually a little bit harder to do than most of those live terms. But to do good investigations, generally people ask me, would you rather have network data or host data? You know what my answer is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like you need them both. You can't give out without the other. And host data becoming increasingly more important as more of the internet becomes encrypted. Right? More encrypted communication at all. So these are examples of basic pivots. Everybody follow? Okay, let's look at realistic pivots. Because those are great pivots, but they're very isolated use cases. So in this case, we have a scenario. While you're hunting, you discover a process whose name leads you to believe it might be malicious. So we're talking about the process run out of the system. Maybe you look at the task list and you see something that's like service host.exe, but the O is a zero. Right? That's, that's weird. <laughs> I'm going to guarantee you that's malicious, so I'm just going to do that. But anyway, um, so question. Remember, that's what we saw, right? We have an observation, we ask questions. Simple questions. Is the file malicious? The implied question with basic data investigation is, is this bad? Fair enough, right? Okay, is this file malicious? Where did the file come from? Two questions we can ask immediately. So those really shape how we go about our investigation, how we want to answer those, and what order we want to answer those. Well, it could look like this. This is realistic too. This is a little more complex, right? So we start with saying system on process logs, we pivot on the MD5 hash to a row file log, those are the row. Then we have a choice to make. We can pivot on the uh, responding IP address with the connection ID, uh, row XTP logs, and the capture the flow data, the OSA. When we get done with that, we can pivot back the other way. Right? I'm not going to go through all this, but you kind of see this is more realistic of what an investigation might look like. We're connecting all these disparate data sources together. We're going through this process of asking questions, making hypotheses, generating answers, asking more questions. Right? It all ties back to that process. But this is realistic here. So the recommendation I'm going to make to you is to better understand what pivots are available to you in your network. Three steps. Number one, this every data source you have available for an investigation. Right? It sounds intimidating. You probably don't have as many as you think you do if you actually think through it. Then, from those data sources, this every field in the data source. This one can get a little big, especially if you think you have this data source or a lot of fields in that. But think of all the ones that you practically use in an investigation. Just all those out. Once you do that, put it in some type of form that's easily digestible. Print it, laminate it, keep it close to your desk. Or if you have a little notebook, I recommend keeping an analyst notebooks, keep that close to your desk too. And you can do that a couple different ways, right? It can be a simple chart like this, or if you want to get fancy and you have a little programming skills, you can build it into a graph database, right? Use something like uh, Neo4j. You got some database skills. It can be a relational database. I like graph databases for this purpose. In this case, what I've done is I've taken a report field and said, I have a report field. What can I use? What can I pivot to from that? And it says, oh, Chris, you can pivot to flow data, firewall logs, or PCAP data. Right? So that's a pretty powerful tool. If you're more senior level in your organization, it's a really powerful tool you can create to train your junior level models. Even if you are junior level, it's very easy to create for yourself. So investigation pivot charts, very valuable, must have. That's right. Aggregations, I said we talk more about. This picture best sums up an aggregation. 
more better, much better than I could. Especially anytime I can think in terms of the food that you could taste. Right? So we got barbecue in the mouth and barbecue. Too much. Alright, aggregation. So again, we're taking specific data fields within our data sources, sorting those, grouping them together, uh, aggregating them. I've talked about one of those already, but I want to talk through a couple more really quickly. We're going through most occurrences and least occurrences and a couple of scenarios that go uh, in relation to those. For most occurrences, here's an example. Query of a web application, uh, the authentication for it at a given time. So maybe you have a custom web application. Or maybe it's something you're using for your finance department or your HR department. Some type of custom web application, you get all the authentications, all the usernames, timestamps go with it for a particular time. A day, a month, a week, wherever you can get it. Aggregate the user accounts sorted by the number of logins. So take every user account that appears and group that, group that based on the number of logins over that time period. Right? That becomes useful data. In this case, it becomes useful just looking at it. First of all, if you know your organization, if you know your people, you can say, geez, Jeff really should have logged in 472 times at 2 a.m. yesterday. Right? And you can also look at fail authentications too, right? Like someone's account has continual number of failed authentication, maybe someone's trying to break into it. Maybe you should consider some other action from that. You can also do comparative analysis. So you can do that for this week, run the search again the next week, and compare the results. Right? If you do that for a few weeks, you should start to get a sense of what those patterns look like. And if you do that, you can eventually start noticing things that's a little weird. If Laura's account only only has three authentications a week, and all of a sudden it has 70, that's weird. That's something we should probably look at. Right? That's, when, that's an observation. Right? That's an observation we can use to then ask questions. Go see how to answer those questions and do an investigation. I think it's as simple as that. Okay. So at least occurrences. In this question, we're going to query Windows service execution logs on a network segment. Uh, so maybe you're using something like Syscon on your Windows host. It'll log every time a process is executed. You can configure it that way. And if you grab all those together, you can aggregate those and aggregate the unique process is sort of our least occurrence. Right? We don't care if the processes that execute consistently everywhere, Word, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Outlook, all those things are going on every machine. We care about things that are only executing on one or two machines. Right? At worst case, you're going to find people installing programs you probably don't want them to have. Search toolbars, random things like that. Best case, you're probably going to find malware. This is probably one of the most successful hunting type activities I've ever done in terms of finding commodity, malware, spyware, things like that running on machines, things that could lead to a lot of, uh, a lot worse, right? Backdoors, things of that nature. Processes that don't belong. This is how I'm finding an observation that there's a process that isn't running. Again, ask questions, see how it goes. It's an aggregation. So a couple more common ones, I'm going to go through these in depth. Bytes communicated. Pick a couple hosts on your network, look at how many uh, bytes are communicated between them, look at top talkers on your network, for instance. Look for anomalies there. Process name, we just talked about that one. HTTP user agent, I used that in an example earlier. HTTPS server certificates. Look for weird domain names compared with weird server certificates that don't make sense. HTTPS isn't something we can get a lot of useful data from, other than session data, but certificates are useful for collecting. You can do that with Pro uh, if you'd like to. Server authentication usernames, if the user is authenticating to a particular server, particularly sensitive servers. Do some of the similar analysis we talked about uh, just a second ago. Web server access logs. Look at access to specific areas of your web server. Look at directories on your web server that really don't only really have a lot of access, and all of a sudden they do. Look at people making requests to directories that don't exist on your web server. Interesting things can be found there. Here's what we grab. CLI commands executed. If you're doing some type of uh, like a Linux host or a routers, you can log the commands being executed on the command line. Look for outliers. Look for, you know, pseudo app get update is probably a pretty common one. NC L P 2222 is probably not one you want to see. Right? That's an internet. Somebody's installing a backdoor and running that, and you will probably pop up with an outlier if you're looking at this report on a time by time basis. So, those are aggregations. Chances are, you probably already started thinking about some aggregations in your network if you run, or thinking about what those results would look like on your network. All these things are very easy to run. You don't need fancy software. You can output the data, crunch numbers in Excel, right? It's a smaller data set. Learn, prep, and set, and offer those Linux command line tools. You don't need fancy stuff. If you have the fancy stuff, that's great. Dump everything into an ELK stack. 
uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kaban. If you have something like Splunk, better yet, download the free version of Splunk. You can put, I think it's two gigabytes of data into it a day. Use it as a sample. Use it if you need to prove value to your boss to show him, hey, we should do more threat hunting. Download it, put some data in as an example, find some bad stuff with it. That's the number one way to get budget, right? Here I found bad stuff, give me money to find more bad stuff. It's a good formula for success. Friendly intel. That's the next thing we're going to talk about. What do I say about what do I mean when I say friendly intel? Many of you have heard of threat intel, right? Keep head shaking. Threat intel is looking for things with bad guys, information about bad guys. I talked about it earlier, it could be open source intelligence. We have an IP address or we have a file name, something related to a threat actor we want to get on that. Threat intel is incredibly important, but I would argue it's the second most important form of threat intel. The most important is friendly intel. That's intel about your own network. We always preach this adage of know your enemy, know yourself, blah, 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 blah. Know yourself, step one. Know your network. Even if you have a large network, know your network. If you have a small network, even better, know your network. It's small. Know your users. Friendly intel matters because when we talk about doing all these behavioral things, and how many times in this talk have already said, let's run this report and look at look for what looks un un you know, unexpected. How do we know what's unexpected if we don't know what's expected? Right? One of the most common things we're going to be doing in investigations is asking questions about systems. Most of those systems we are systems. Right? They're not just all remote systems, they're our systems. So you need to know what the baseline is. What is the role of this system? What users use it? When do those users normally log in? These are that it's friendly intel. It's very important. One of the things I recommend is the concept of history physical. Uh, it's, it's taken from the medical field, and it's something that if you've gone to see a doctor and you've been a practitioner maybe for the first time, the first thing that you want to do is a history of physical, physical right? They learn about your medical history, they learn about your baseline stats, they take your temperature, your blood, right? All those basic things. Same concept really applies generally for your network, because it's going to help you make better decisions later. Same reason your doctor is interested in that. The difference between for the analyst, uh, ATP is based upon, not human body, but on systems and users. Right? That's the best division I can do when I think to divide those. Is systems are separate from users. I know sometimes we like to think of them as the same, but they're very different. Uh, the systems and users is what we're talking about here. Um, and generally, the way I recommend doing that is if you don't have the ability to do that in any other way, but you don't have a tool like ServiceNow, something a lot of people use, you can do it for free. No excuse not to get started now. If you have nothing, here's where I would recommend starting. Perhaps a passive something asset detection system. It looks at your network traffic, identifies systems based upon uh, passive analysis of the traffic, identifies what they are, helps you build network inventory. That's pretty cool. In map, that's active scanning. You need to cross in map. Uh, scan all the systems on my network, find out about open ports, listing services, things of that nature. Run those scans every now and then, store them in the same place, and you have uh, a baseline to look at. I run into a system of mine, I don't know what it does, but look at the in-map scan and see what ports are listening. Or if AE is listening, it's probably a web server. Wow, that's pretty cool. The Hive. The Hive is a case management system. If you don't have a way to manage your cases uh, when you're doing investigations, taking notes of those things, the Hive is generally my recommendation. It's free, it's open source, it's very flexible. You can set it up, uh, I think, for three commands uh, to authorize. So you can take those case notes, you can actually put information about systems in there, and whenever you have an IP address, a friendly IP address that you found, and you want to know more about it, search for it in your case management system. What's that going to tell you? If anybody's ever run an investigation on it before, or if you have, you might think you'll remember, but you won't. Uh, um, Active Directory. Most of us run Windows networks, we have Active Directory. Don't log out of that. Just knowing what groups things are in is really useful for telling uh, information about them. Uh, and finally, GER, which is a Google product, a uh, Google Rapid Response. It's an endpoint detection response product. It's free. Uh, you can install agents on all your workstations. You can use that to proactively pull information, any, basically any information you want from the endpoints to collect information proactively. So that's not necessarily before the case, grab the data, although you can store that. Uh, and once you grab all this data, uh, again, not uh, nothing too crazy here. You can have it all stored in disparate places. What I recommend is put it in the central place, two places. One is an elk stack, as Mark mentioned, really the data in and out of that. There are uh, tools you can go use to deploy an app stack, just a few commands. And you can dump the data into there. It gives you a, a nice, pretty interface where you can run searches. You can actually do aggregations based on the fields, really easy. Just click on a field and get an aggregation. It's pretty cool. 
Uh, and no wiki. That's what uh, really any wiki will do. That's what I recommend. It's really simple, very straightforward. Um, create a wiki, especially if you're not the only analyst, not the only security person in your organization. You just keep notes. You will not remember if you do not keep notes. That's important. So create a knowledge base. That's the tool uh, I recommend. Uh, abstract tool I recommend for collecting threat, uh, friendly threat intelligence. And remember, kids, the only way to make screwing around in science is writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> last thing. Yep, last thing. Mies and plus. Who knows what Mies and plus stands for? Everything in place. Everything in place. Um, there food, there's food on the screen. I, I can't get through a presentation without having multiple food examples. <laughs> I'm getting hungry now, just looking at it. But, um, Mies and plus is a term chefs use. Right? Generally, when you see a professional cook or professional chef prepare food, they get everything ready at once. They get something like this, right? They get everything in place at once, and then they cook, right? It's that whole uh, a, a, a ounce of preparation is worth a pound of cure, right? It's being prepared. And that's very important. That's one of the more important abstract tools. You can see more examples of uh, needs or needs and plots for different meals. You'll see one for chicken, soup, goat cheese, etc. Everything's prepared. Everything's laid out. I don't know if I don't think about this enough when we're doing our investigations. There's a time when I didn't, and when I started thinking about it, it really changed things for me quite dramatically. So there are a few basic tenets of needs and flaws and how that relates, I think, to the investigator, the security practitioner, or more specifically for this talk, the hunter. One is to minimize movement. Right? When you think about chefs, they lay everything out very closely. Right? There's food here, there's food here, the pot is right here. They don't have to move a lot. And the reason is because they're preparing a few hundred meals a night for all these different people and they don't want to be just plum tuckered out by the end of it. So minimizing movement. Now, how do I do, I don't move a lot in my office. I sit in the chair, uh, it's, it's great. And you can tell I don't move a lot. Uh, I need to move more. Uh, minimizing movement. In this case, I mean minimizing analytic movement. One of the most common things we're gonna do is seek answers. Seeking answers is going out to data sources, retrieving that data, parsing it in some way, and then interpreting. Now let's be clear, you can automate some of these things. Anytime a human is, is spending retrieving data, it can probably be automated. Anytime a human is spending analyzing data and making decisions on it, cannot be. Right? Humans at the center of the process, that's absolutely critical throughout this. Human at the center of the process. So if you're the human and if all those other things can be automated, why aren't you doing it? Right? Now I recognize it might not always be the perfectly easy to automate those things, but if let's say you need your packet capture file, and to get that, you have to go out to a sensor, hop to another sensor, download the file here, download it there, filter it there, pull it back. I've worked in these places. And it takes 10 minutes to pull a packet capture. And it could be cut down to 30 seconds. That's wasted time. It's wasted movement. You're moving the data too much. You're moving logically through your network too much to get the answer you need to your investigations. It's also forcing context. Absolutely. It's forcing context. So, this is, this is a cognitive enemy of the analyst, as I call it. It's causing you problems you don't need, and it can kill an entire day. Because especially if you wait for 10 minutes, you might not forget what question you were asking about when you get the data. I've seen that happen plenty. It happens to me all the time. You know how to move. Waste nothing. Chefs don't waste a lot. You cut up a chicken, you cook the chicken, you throw the bones away. No, you're going to make it stop. And that becomes soup or something else. Waste nothing. For us, that means only getting the data which you need. One of the primary mistakes I see the beginning security analysts do is, okay, I need to analyze packet capture data for a single IP. I'm going to go get 24 hours worth of data for that IP. That's a lot of data. And they think, okay, I'll get all that data and I'll just carve it down to what I need. And sure, they get what they want to get at some point. And those carving skills are important too. But we start with all that data and you carve it all down. You're artificially introducing more movement, really, and you're in a lot of waste. Collecting data you don't need, you're wasting bits. But, so start small. Get the smallest amount of data you need and work your way up. It's faster nine times out of ten, probably 99 times out of 100. You can also use varying data sets to help with that, right? I mentioned NetFlow earlier. NetFlow is really fast, it's very small. Do broad searches in NetFlow to narrow your time rank down and then do it to DK. Right? Data size matters. It takes time, time is the end. We want to talk about how the most important thing is being accurate. Being accurate is important. But in most of our organizations, security is a cost center. We've got to be conscious of that. And truly, security is an economic problem, right? We want to decrease the cost it takes to defend a network so we can compete with the attackers who already have a very low cost to attack them. 
Here's my name. Clean as you go. I work with, I used to work with a guy. I'm not gonna say he's sitting in this room right now. Every time he pulled data, he would pull it back to his desktop and name it test. <laughs> the second one was test one. The one next one that was test dot two. Sometimes you'd have to back them up. Test dot one dot back. Test dot three dot back. Now I think on Jason, I, I used to do this too. I still do it sometimes. We all do, right? We throw things on our desktop, throw things in a notebook. We don't organize them, and we sure as heck like we'll, we'll go to, go try to backtrack on an investigation the next day, and then which test dot three dot seven dot back was it, right? Clean as you go. It's very important. It sounds silly, it sounds trivial, but keeping your analytic work environment very clean <laughs> keeps clutter out of your mind. Working memory space in humans is really limited. Right? We have long term memory, which can give it long, things like they're stored long term. Short term memory, very fine capacity. Not only that, we can't really do anything to increase it. Generally speaking, the thought is that working memory, short term memory is a finite capacity that you're born with and you can't really expand it too much. They generally say you can hold seven ish things in your working memory, plus or minus two. What those things are, how you constitute them, is a bit of a different possibility. Work memory is limited, so clean as you go. Be a friend of your work memory. And finally, be flexible, right? I won't harp on this one too much, but that sources, things go down, things break, things don't always look the way you think they're going to look. So just because a pivot, you answered it one question with one pivot one day, you might have to take a different pivot the other day. So you have to keep your mind free, floaty, uh, a little bit flexible in terms of playbooks are great. I love and advocate for playbooks, but you can't be married to them. You have to be willing to divert from them as well. So being flexible is key. Um, so will go wrong. Uh, that's security. <clears throat> so that. So we're gonna wrap up. I think you class about this. Uh, I'm not going to harp on too much here. We're actually auctioning one of those off. Uh, you're interested in such things. Uh, you can learn about it there. Um, one more couple more things, but let's take some questions. Yeah. Um, so you suggested um, help for data storage. Um, most of the data is probably at least semi structured, if not. Formally structured. Have you considered using a structured data store that would scale better than something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really use whatever you're comfortable with. So the question was, would you consider using those in here? Would you consider using a more structured data store that scales better than Elk? And definitely Elk has some scaling issues. But my general approach when I'm speaking here is most businesses are small businesses. Uh, most security practitioners are actually just network admins who have to do security. So I speak to a little bit of a smaller audience. But yes, by all means, um, if you need to use something to scale better, do it. It will scale, but at a resource in time, it like, takes a lot of stuff. You have to go a lot of that sometimes. Uh, especially if you're searching really dramatically and doing crazy rate of expressions. I recommend that as a starting point. If you're just starting, if you do this at a crazy high level, you're probably going to have to change something. If you do the, the same thing, you almost just like a rated DB uh, install, it would basically be the same technical investment. You can do it with any better performance. You can do it with a uh, MySQL database. You can do it with any database you want. I, I, the reason I like Elk, honestly, is because it comes with Kibana. And Kibana is a very simple interface that you can draw off the bat that does aggregations. You don't have to build anything. That's what that's trying to do. Um, so, the, in the process, you talked about you know, first time you looked at your data, you went out there and you took responders. Same thing, like, you never look at your data, everything looks bad. Yeah. Like, in, in the midst of an incident, it's not when you, you know, want to always drive a hole coming out of that. So, do you have a recommendation on, on just, I guess, a structured way people should go through their environment and get into it? Yeah, with all that. You know, just uh, most environments I see today still. You know, the only time people are looking at that stuff is, you know, when something's on fire. Yeah, so the question was, if you didn't hear on that side of the room, was do I have a recommendation for a way to go through your data for the first time to start getting a baseline of maybe what's normal? Is that what I hear correctly? Yeah. Okay, so um, that's a tough question. It's hard to do, right? Um, generally, what I recommend is tying things, yeah, tie, tie things to sensitive assets. So ultimately, our goal in our businesses, whatever structure they make happen, is to prevent loss. So it's the old CIA class, like confidentiality, integrity, availability, that type of thing. So what are your business goals? Where does the most risk exist? Is there a critical business? If I'm a pharmaceutical company, chances are the biggest thing I'm concerned about is protecting my intellectual property. If I'm on Amazon.com, I'm concerned about time availability. 
because uh, you know you measure seconds of downtime and millions or billions of dollars. Right? So it's figuring out where that last month is expected and then translating that to technical risk. What, what, what is the worst case scenario? Start there, identify the assets related to that and the users related to that, right? So it's keeping web servers and databases up, it's protecting confidential information, a file server, web servers, identify those specific things, start there, start with those hosts and the users who use them or maintain them. From there, do all the things we talked about here, aggregations, things like that, start looking at when these people normally log in, get a wiki, write these things down, uh, look at what software is installed on these things. Run that search every week. Did something didn't pop up that shouldn't have popped up? Well, that's that's how you're building a baseline looking for things that are anomalous. Right? So it's, it's identifying risk, translating that to technical uh, assets, and then starting to look at these, these individual things uh, like like server log, like host based stuff, uh, flow data. I'm not telling anyone, the thing you don't do is go take 24 hours of PCAP on a host and try to just do that. It's not too efficient, right? You start with things like flow data or post data things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. It's, yeah, just uh, so I actually agree with me on my second question, which you know, you're talking about building out that knowledge base. It seems like a lot of what you'd be building out, you know, those, you know, all the components of, of your different log files and stuff like that, you know, basically like what a partial is doing for a sim or something like that. Yeah. Um, is there a way where you don't have to do that from scratch? Is there any knowledge bases out there where you can just, you know, okay, I've got this, this, and this, let's pull that in, and then, you know, put it in some format that I'm going to print and blend it. So, that is a good question, and for free, there's not, there, there are things that will do it, but I've never found anything that I love that is free, so I don't have to on that. But that's, that's how I recommend to take these six different tools, take the data from those, dump it into an L, and that's what you get or any type of structured data store or whatever. But yeah, that, that gives you basically that starting point. There are things you can buy. Uh, I, you know, service now is one a lot of people use. It's all right. There are other ones you can buy. They're like network inventory tools. It's kind of amazing that network asset inventory is not in a much further place than it is. Especially, you, felt, you would have thought someone would come along right now and create a great free open source tool for that. Uh, and there are some things that people try that I'm not that I'm happy with. Not to say I'm not all the numbers, maybe something out there, I'll just not know. Yeah, that's well. No, I mean, and you can also like not use and like things like endpoint detection agents like GER kind of becomes that a little bit. Right? You have an endpoint agent on everything and you pull out data back and put it in one place. That's kind of network inventory to make sure that agent is on everything. And that's that's a free version. There's obviously paid versions, Fire has um, HX, I think it is, and, and there are different endpoint detection agents. Well, uh, I wasn't thinking about inventory as much as uh, like more like a legend, you know, like, like here's all the fields available. Like, you know, oh, so you're not a pivot chart. Right, I mean, because yeah. that's what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, that's right. printing out so that, like, yeah. if, if you're working with key data sources, you can see, okay, these, there's a common key that you can use. So, there's not a or something. Like I'm actually working on something right now. I'm okay. planning to hopefully release it either during time or inside of Augusta Light this year. So you can uh, nice. hopefully build a config file and it'll create a graph for you and it'll be all done. So, so you're going to want to try. <laughs> 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 yeah, just, uh, kind of... Okay, a certain amount of time that you would uh, generally want to allot to a hunter, you would want to break the data down into a manageable amount of time where you have results or. I guess when I'm looking at some of these things, like if you have 10 or 20,000 assets, uh, like uh, maybe HTTP user agents, like it could take maybe a week to go through, or how would you usually approach these, uh, just kind of time-wise to try to get a yeah. big so, so, run? So when I'm analyzing data, maybe I'll do an aggregation thing like that, what chunks of time would I break things into to do the analysis? <laughs> I don't have a good answer, it's, it, it's going to vary really well. Right? And it's going to depend on how much data I have, how fast I can parse it, uh, I don't really want to do anything that's going to take me more than an hour to parse that. Right? If, I, if I get a week of stuff and it's going to take me all day to parse it or pull it down or aggregate it or whatever, I don't want to do that. So it takes a little bit of hours force power I have. Um, and it's going to vary really wildly. I'm sorry about that. Answer that. It's, it's, I would say, again, waste, waste a little, start small. Start with an hour. If you do that for a while, don't get anything useful out of it, go up to a day. Yeah. I got a couple. 
Are there any design or architectural principles that you think make hunting harder or easier for people design uses? So, are there any design principles like network design principles that make things easier from hunting perspective? Um, I don't think necessarily specifically for hunting, other than just general principles of building a defensible network. Good segmentation, um, inventory really comes into play, really do again. You know? So I don't necessarily, I mean, I want to never be architected securely, but I don't think of anything immediately comes to mind that I say, as a hunter, I want to architect it this way, other than like sensor placement. That's very important, right? Like all my sensors uh, downstream from your NAT devices. So when I'm looking at uh, uh, network traffic, I'm getting the actual true internal IP addresses, not just the valid IP addresses. Right? So sensor design, stuff like that, but that, that would be good. I would argue that the information architecture of what you're pulling in can have a big difference to the extent that you have the ability to shape how the logs, for example, are aggregates and that could make it easier. Sure. Um, that, that was the things that I've seen that have a big difference. Um, I, have, uh, I have a couple things to give away. Um, one of these is the my book, uh, it's not signed, but I will sign um, <laughs> I could write whatever I wanted, but I said, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're in Nashville. I think you're always from Nashville, live in Nashville. Good portion. Okay, um, how about those predators? Hey. Yeah. Okay, here's a trivia question for you. First hand I see is going to call Predators just one series. How many? Goals with the Blackhawks score in the whole series. Three. Alright? <laughs> 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 um, I have a gift bag from the conference, which looks like it has a cup and a pen and a book and some other stuff. Um, it also has the, uh, the keynote speaker for book at the beginning. Um, let's ask another predator question. You can't almost watch. <laughs> Who was the first coach of the predators? Great shots. Great shots. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so that's pretty much all I got. One quick thing. We're having the World Technology Fund silent auction. I'm auctioning off. Um, I see it in this class. You can probably get it much cheaper than you can pay for it. Um, I, my, my practical hack analysis of a class for that. We're auctioning off that. Also auctioning off another signed copy of the book. Those are things are being auctioned off in the fishbowl area all the way down into the right. Um, that auction is going to end in the I'm going to take a slow mosey in the five minutes it takes me to walk back there and get out of this room. So if you're interested in participating, go out there. Um, if you want to get in touch with these slides, will be posted at some point. I'll tweet about it. Otherwise, that's all I got. Thank you all.